Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA is a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. Hello, and welcome to Voices from DARPA. I'm your host, Tom Shortridge. Generative artificial intelligence, or AI, has captured the world's attention after recent advances in the commercial sector. Its ability to create deepfakes, or highly realistic multimedia, has turned a once highly specialized skill into something as easy as the click of a button. As a result, the threat of manipulated media, audio, images, video, and text, has increased, and social media continues to provide a ripe environment for viral content sharing. But not all media manipulations have the same real-world impact. For example, computer-generated editing techniques used by the film industry are employed for very different reasons than bad actors manipulating media to target reputations, the global impression of the state of a military conflict, or other aspects of society. Understanding how and why something may have been manipulated gives important context that can be used to better understand and counter similar malicious behavior in the future. Within DARPA's Information Innovation Office, Dr. Will Corvey heads up a program called Semantic Forensics, a term of art to describe the kind of analytic explainability needed for this kind of multimedia analysis. Semaphore expands on previous DARPA research from a similar program known as Media Forensics, which focused on image manipulation detection. That generative AI boom I just talked about, that's changed the game and motivations of semantic forensics. How exactly? Here's Will to explain. So we think this kind of forensic science is becoming really important as generative AI proliferates across the internet. So at the beginning of the program, the answer that I would have given you is that anything that we find that is synthetic or manipulated online is potentially of interest because it's so remarkable because most of the data online has not been digitally retouched or digitally synthesized. I think now actually what we're experiencing is almost the inverse, where much of the data that we consume online is potentially retouched by AI. And now what we need to understand is much more about the methods that are being applied and how they combine in order to give us a characterization of whether it's a benign manipulation or whether it's something that might be of concern to an analyst. So break down how semantic forensics technology works. Semaphore is a program that's designed to do three core tasks to detect, to attribute, and to characterize misinformation and synthetic media at scale as it's presented to us on the internet. So Semaphore has four technical areas. Technical area one involves all of the different analytics for detection, attribution, and characterization across different modalities like video or text or audio or image. TA2 or technical area two is our infrastructure uh, and integration TA. So basically, how do we assemble all of those analytics into a runtime environment that enables us to do evaluation and experimentation? Technical area three is actually for the evaluation. So we have robust evaluation tasks within the program that allow us to benchmark performance. So when we hand this off to a transition partner, we know exactly how it will behave. And then TA4, technical area four, gives us insight into the threat landscape, which then informs the way that we run evaluations. Obviously, everyone is a little bit surprised right now by the quality of outputs and the proliferation of outputs from generative AI. I think we've been a little bit surprised at the brazenness of some of the use of generative AI in the recent past as well. So for instance, there was a well-known Zelensky deepfake that was put on, on social media early in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That was not a very good deepfake, but it was, to our knowledge, the first use of a deepfake in the context of war. And so that kind of changed for us the way within the program we were thinking about how deepfakes might be deployed on social media and the quality, honestly, of deepfake that we could expect there. It was also quite interesting that the next day, Ukraine actually put out a deepfake of Putin that was higher quality. And so we're witnessing now the potential of these technologies to be utilized for various purposes during conflict. In addition to examining the effects of generative AI content, Semaphore researchers have been leveraging AI techniques to power their analytics. Here's Will again. 
The most interesting implementation of AI in the program is actually the infusion of human expertise into, for instance, the detectors or the attribution schemes that are being applied for detecting the output of the large pre-trained models. When we think about AI, most of the time, what immediately comes to mind is artificial general intelligence. So a very powerful human-like reasoning engine. This program certainly is not implementing an intelligence of that type, but the intelligence that we're able to apply from our forensic experts into neural network architectures is quite profound. And so this is one of the reasons why we see detectors in the program that outperform the ability of generators on the market to outsmart them, because they're in fact a combination of both the machine learning intuitions that are available from adversarial learning architectures like GANs, and then also the human ability of the forensic examiners that are on the team. Gotcha. So it's even it's it's harkening back to the licklighter human machine, the symbiosis. Yes. Yeah, very much so. Have the threats in this landscape changed since the program began? And if so, how? So one of the most interesting, sometimes terrifying, often fun aspects of the program is that we have an entire technical area that's devoted to threat landscape modeling. And the reason for that is the scariest threats in deepfakes and manipulated media are the ones that we don't know about and that we couldn't possibly detect online anyway because we lack the technology to do so. For sort of known threats, we've collaborated with our performer NVIDIA to take a close look at the outputs of their face generation architecture style GAN. And in fact, that was a collaboration that led us to be able to test their newest architect for that prior to release so that we could release a detector alongside the generator. Because face generation is for impersonation threats and other kinds of things, probably one of the most obvious online threats today. We also have taken a look at video falsification, so of the person of interest models quite closely, as well as aspects of scientific integrity. So this is a collaboration between Purdue and HHS, where they've been looking at grant applications and other potential materials in order to figure out where image falsification, for instance, might be apparent in those materials. One of the places where our TA4 team, along with our performer Kitware and subcontractor UIUC, have really showed promise is on news article generation and identification. The company Kitware heads up a team of six subcontractors for the Semantic Information Defender project under Semaphore, which is creating so-called algorithmic armor by developing various capabilities for detecting, attributing, and characterizing disinformation in news articles found on social media. Here's Ursuline Basharit, the Assistant Director of Computer Vision at Kitware. So we are addressing multiple modalities in the detection stage. We are addressing generated images that are generated by the latest forms of AI, these days stable diffusion and nerve models and others that are becoming very popular. We have deep fake video detection algorithms for the video modality. We have also for news articles and other text modalities, text that is generated by AI models like GPT of the day and others, for instance, that are very popular these days. And then we have attribution algorithms where we're trying to further understand after we have detected something, where is that synthetic media component, what kind of generator, what kind of technique was utilized to generate that. We're also attributing to specific sources, what we think, given a model, we think whether that piece of media came from that particular source or not. So that's a piece of our attribution pieces that we're building, including attributing to various different types of generators like StyleGAN for images, space, and then for characterization, we are trying to develop this understanding of the intent that might be used, whether this specific type of what was the reasoning or what was a tool or technique that was developed. For instance, if it was call to action is one of the intent types. The main thing that I've seen to be effective so far and hope that it will be effective is uh, essentially diversity and having a variety of defenses and try to basically diversify our kind of technologies that we use. So just for example, for the deepfake video detection, there is you know a lot of emphasis in the community on the statistical models for defenses and detection that have to be trained by a specific type of threats. But then we have also been looking at some of the biometric models that are based on the specialized models trained on specific person of interest, for instance, 
And that seemed to show a lot of promise and helps us with some of the diversity that we talk about. And then we constantly are trying to look at research that is designed from the bottom up to be more robust to open set kind of problems where new threats that might be coming out in the future. For instance, we are looking at also adding not just the visual features, but also the audio features along with how some of the movement of the specific parts of the mouth, for instance, or the head movement, and even some of the folks in the community are looking at hand movement and hand gestures as you speak. It's on the latest groundbreaking research that's going on with analysis of the facial features and especially with the advent of AI and uh, models. Those might be also key to help mitigate some of these factors. I also spoke with Luisa Verdoliva, a pioneer in the field of deepfake research and a professor at the University of Naples in Italy. She is working with the Semaphore team out of Purdue University to detect and localize possible manipulation in images, videos, and audio. She agrees that diversity is key, not just in the solutions to stay ahead of the evolving nature of deepfake technology, but in the ideas being brought forth by all 12 of the research teams on Semaphore. The more type of tools you have, the better you can reason on them and have an explanation of what happened. Even in Semaphore, where we develop a lot of different algorithms, it's very important the work of the fusion team where they have to understand the type of different artifacts in order to make a good fusion of the detectors. The work we are doing, uh, my team is doing, is actually on passive methods. So methods that try to detect if an image or video or audio is manipulated. But what is also important is uh, using active methods. So where you protect the data by inserting a sort of signature. And this can be done even like recently trying not only by using watermarking methods, but also protecting the data could mean I protect the data so that I make some processing to the data so that it's difficult to manipulate them. And this is also something that uh, I think is interesting. The fact that with DARPA, I started to work on multimodal analysis, which is important. So like working on video and audio together, this really gave a lot of improvement in terms of detection. And also the fact that there is all this interest to text and uh, all this research on text also is really um, important uh, trying to put together the information on of different modalities so this can be really helpful for understanding what's happened for the content you are actually analyzing what is really great uh, i think in the program is that uh, we can see a lot of different direction in terms of research the program is very large and uh, you can see really a lot of different researchers that are not specific of your field. And this helps a lot, helps to open your mind, uh, look at different perspectives, try to understand how to fuse uh, the possible results. So even if we do not specifically maybe work with another team, but we can use their work and try to understand what uh, was a good solution or a bad one. Or for example, some teams uh, develop a data set and this could be used for other teams to train the algorithm. So in this respect, it's really a great experience. I think I really learned a lot during the program. The research in the area of deep fake analysis isn't confined to one sector. And according to Will, it will take the effort of everyone to stay ahead of future threats. Though Will notes some key differences between DARPA's work and industries, and discusses the plan to transition the research into real-world applications. We take a close look at what's going on in industry. So for instance, there's been some really robust work out of some of the commercial sector for face analysis and telling whether in particular a video of a human is a deep fake or an actual human being. We've tended to sort of differ in, in two ways. One is the breadth of data that we take a look at. So we're trying to characterize, attribute, and detect, first of all, all of the different types of manipulation and synthesis that might be present online, because that's kind of what's facing the government analyst. But also, we're very interested in figuring out very specific failure modes of the technology. And so we have 
with our evaluation technical area, a lot of thought and analysis going into isolating error in the analytics so that we can provide a robust analysis to our analytic community. Because DARPA is a funding agency, it's critical for program managers to think about how to transition the agency's research and development to those operational communities after a program ends. In Semaphore's case, how will they plan to get the diverse Semaphore toolset to the government analyst community? Will explains. So we have basically three transition pathways that we utilize in the program. One is simply open sourcing the technology. So a number of our university performers already provide links to their applications from their university GitHub pages and the like. And we think that's a really powerful way to provide early analytics out to the community. The second pathway that we look towards is commercialization. So we are constantly talking with our performers about potential commercial application of their analytics because that can often be a way to incubate these kinds of analytics within industry in order to strengthen them and harden them for deployment. The third strategy that we employ is a more direct marketing to government transition partners. So for that, we've actually established within the program a startup team infrastructure where each startup team is dedicated to one or more transition partners, and they are operating on an agile software development timeline. So they have two weeks, for instance, three months spirals where they're delivering early capabilities out to government that equally can be applied to commercial transition partners. Have any of your transition partners been able to use the current Semaphore technology? So we have a really robust integration effort on the program, which allows us via startup teams to get technologies out early and often to our transition base. So for instance, Health and Human Services has already received some analytics and is experimenting with that in some of their scientific integrity workflows. We also have integrations that are being prepared for multiple other government transition partners, as well as experimentation with commercial ventures within the program and our performer base. On the surface, it may seem like a cat and mouse game for deep fake researchers to stay on top and ahead of the advancing state of generative AI. But Will says they're optimistic about society's ability to get their arms around this challenge. From my perspective as the program manager for Semaphore, I've gotten a really close look at a lot of different synthetic and manipulated media types and the kinds of generative architectures that are behind them. And what I can say is that I have great hope and optimism for the future of these technologies because we've got a lot of great thinking about the ethical application of the technology as well as the inner workings of the technology and its limitation. And so I think what we're headed towards is both an assured application of the technology, so, so a safe application, but also a socially responsible application due to the robust discussion that we're having around AI and its potential use for social good. I'm really, really excited about the way that we've been able, due to the mature algorithms from our predecessor program Metaphor and then early Semaphore work, from that technical foundation, we've been able to build out a startup architecture that then lends itself towards iterative transition. So I'm really excited to see the community start to use some of these tools in a broader way so that we can facilitate this kind of analysis across our government partners and across the broader community. And to that end, I'm really excited about our experimentation in figuring out how to democratize these kinds of technologies further, either by innovations around training data or through studying the runtime characteristics of analytics to figure out how to deploy them using less computational power and other sorts of initiatives. I think also we should all be excited about what's likely to come out in the next few months from industry, because this is going to be a really exciting area to watch and, of course, from our perspective, to protect. That's it for this episode of Voices from DARPA. Thanks for listening. For additional information on the Semantic Forensics Program or other programs that Dr. Will Corfe is working on, please check the show notes or visit darpa.mil. Special thanks to Heather Deeds for her assistance in producing this episode. 